Good morning and welcome to the Community Baptist Church online service. If you're viewing this, it is most likely because our church services were snowed out from the big storm that we had Saturday. And so uh, you're viewing this from home. We're looking forward to enjoying this time of preaching and teaching from the Word of God. I do want to say uh, thank you for tuning in and I hope that you'll gather your family right now as we prepare to look at Matthew chapter 7 once again as we continue with our series, The King and His Kingdom. And so with that, why don't we go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. We'll ask God's blessing this time and we'll ask Him to uh, help us with the understanding of His Word. And uh, so let's go ahead and begin now with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to meet like this. With the advent of technology, we have the privilege of being in people's homes and uh, being able to study the Word of God together. And so we thank you for this great privilege that we have. So we ask now that your blessings be upon this service, that you would please bring our people back together soon, and that we would enjoy the fellowship together in one location at the church uh, building. But we do ask now that you would please bless this time of study. May you help me to say only those things that are necessary for this time of study. May the people have ears to hear what you have preserved for us in your wonderful Word of God. We thank you and praise you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're looking at Matthew chapter number 7, and we'll be studying verses 7 through 12. In my introduction, we have a few uh, notes that are from our previous lesson. So last time we met, we studied Matthew 7, 1 through 6, where we learned that Jesus was teaching his disciples not to be judgmental. Uh, the meaning that I gave to that was uh, fault finders. Uh, there are many people that are easy critics. In other words, they're, they're rash. They can be what we call judgmental. Uh, they really don't think about perhaps what the others are going through. In the setting that Jesus was teaching, he was dealing with the religious rulers of the day, the Pharisees uh, of that day who were the religious leaders. They made up their own rules as they went along, but they were very quick to judge other people's actions. Uh, what I've found as a Christian over many years is that uh, we have to learn to give people the benefit of the doubt. We have to learn to uh, deal with people where they're at. And uh, they may not do things the way that we think they should do them. They may not act the way that we think a Christian should act. Uh, but that's really not our job to sit there and criticize them. Many people need the Lord Jesus Christ in order to help them change some of those things. But then those of you who have changed over the years shouldn't sit in judgment of someone that took you 10, 20, 30 years to overcome certain things. Don't sit in judgment on someone else. And so as we look at the Word of God last week, we looked at those who may be uh, finding fault in others. Now, even though many people know this verse, in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1, Judge not, lest ye be judged. Uh, they use it uh, incorrectly. Jesus does tell us that we are to judge. We are to make good judgments, and we are to be discerning people as Christians. We make judgments every single day. People have to decide uh, who they're going to hang out with. People have to decide if it's a, a good decision or not. Maybe it's a financial decision. So we make judgments all the time. Scriptures teach us that we're to judge righteously, meaning that we're to judge with God's intentions or God's right standing or position. So we must know the word, we must understand it, and we don't go around judging people necessarily, but when it comes or falls in our lap or we're in a situation where we have to try to deal with something on a spiritual level, we are to know what the Bible says. If we're in a position of offering advice, then we're to do it, uh, and sometimes it's not received well. So with that, Jesus was trying to teach his disciples not to have a harsh, critical spirit when dealing with people in the work of God. And we have to take a lesson from this. So, as we move along now to chapter 7, verses 7 through 12, that theme kind of carries over just a little bit, but notice what it starts off with here in verse number 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of, of you, whom if his son ask bread, would give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, would give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things? 
to them that ask him. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So we have a, a great portion of scripture uh, that really puts a little bit more in perspective. As I mentioned last week in our series, or on, in the sermon, uh, this chapter number 7 really kind of summarizes what took place in chapters 5 and 6. And so as we look again here at verses 7 through 12, uh, it's continue on, uh, it's a continuation, if you would, of the uh, verses 1 through uh, 6. And I'm going to use verse number 6 in this as an illustration as well. But then it also summarizes some of the other lessons that we learned in chapters 5 and 6. So let's go ahead and start right here with just mentioning what we're going to find in this portion of Scripture. Uh, we have three main points of this passage. If you want to jot them down or if you want to follow along in the Scriptures, persistent prayer, paternal provision, and prescribed practice. So we're going to start first of all in verses 7 and 8 with persistent prayer. As I've already read those verses to you, I won't uh, reiterate that, but the idea is uh, that of persistent prayer. The Bible says here to ask, to seek, and to knock. Each one of these seems to be a progression in asking God for something. Uh, many people give up. They, they have said, well, I prayed and God didn't answer me. I prayed and this didn't happen. What we notice here in verse number 7, it says, Ask, seek, knock. Verse number 8 goes on to say, uh, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And so it, this testifies of a privilege that God gives to all believers to pray. Now think of that. The God of the universe has given us, we his followers, those who claim Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, he gives us the privilege to pray, to communicate with Him, to talk to Him, to ask Him for things. Secondly, it accentuates the need to pray persistently. So many of us give up. We've asked God and it didn't happen. Well, if you were to keep asking God, it would demonstrate that your persistence would demonstrate that you really are desirous to have this thing answered. And God would pay attention to that. So we ask, we seek, we knock. We keep asking until we get an answer from God. Thirdly, it portrays the dependability of our God to answer prayer. There's no one else in the world that can answer our prayers. Now, you may go and ask a friend for money. You may go ask somebody for a favor. But when it's something above and beyond the abilities of another human, maybe it's something that is a health-related issue. Maybe it's something bigger than you know anyone else can handle. You can turn to God and say, God, I need you. And if you don't get it by asking, then you ask more. You seek. You look harder. And if you don't get up by seeking, you start knocking. Now you think about it. Knocking gets people's attention. If I take time here and knock, everyone's attention is now drawn to that knocking. And you're thinking, after a while, if somebody doesn't answer that door, I'm going to answer that door. Well, God uses that as an illustration, that if we don't get something by asking, then we seek His face. If we don't get it by seeking His face, then you knock. So it's increasing the intensity if it's a real need. And sometimes through that, God will answer you in different ways. Now listen to what John 15, 7 states. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. A couple key here, keys that we find here. If ye abide in me, that's Jesus Christ. Number one, do you abide in him? First, are you a truly born again believer? Secondly, are you living or dwelling in His presence? Do you spend time with God? Do you walk with God? Do you study His Word? Do you know what His will is? And then third, thirdly, it says there, ask what ye will. That what ye will doesn't mean anything in the world. Now, sometimes we think, well, I asked God for a million dollars. He didn't give it to me. Well, don't be silly about your prayer requests. If you know it's according to God's will, particularly what He's talking about, when we study these portions of scriptures, Matthew 7, John 15, he's talking about his will that pertains to his work, his ministry. John 15, if you abide in him, in the vine, uh, he wants you to bear fruit. Well, obviously, if you're doing that which pleases God, he's going to help you bear more spiritual fruit. Matthew chapter 7, he's, he's talking to us about dealing with the ministry, uh, God's work, going forth with His disciples. Well, if you ask Him anything according to His will is being used for Him, He says He hears those prayers and He's willing to answer those prayers. 
And so again, it comes, uh, our understanding needs to be involved with our prayers. Are we praying for something that's according to God's will? If so, keep praying till He answers. It, he may answer you with a no, but He may answer you with the, with the, the request you've desired and you see how God can give you uh, the answers to your prayers. So persistent prayer is mentioned by Jesus in several passages of Scripture. He gives us illustrations. Luke chapter 11 is one of those. We find a friend persistently going to another friend to ask him for a need. Luke chapter number 18, we have a widow that persistently uh, went to uh, the judge to, to ask him for something. And because of her persistence, persistence and keep asking and keep asking and keep asking, finally she was able to get what she asked for. The Lord Jesus Christ used those as illustrations to us to be persistent in our prayers. If you know you're praying something according to God's will, Keep asking. Keep asking Him until He answers your prayer. Now, we can't put God in the corner. We can't tell God what we want and expect Him to deliver. But if we are confident that God is in this, we're confident that God's will is going to be followed, then you can ask and be persistent about it. He'll let you know whether you should keep praying. But oftentimes, we just kind of die off in our prayers, and it really shows that we're not serious about that which we're, we're asking Him. So don't quit on God. Be a faithful and a fervent follower of Jesus Christ. Be persistent in your prayer. Next, a paternal provision, verses 9 through 11. The idea of a paternal provision, paternal relating to that of fatherly. And what we find in our text here in, in verse number 9, it says, Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will give him a stone? Well, the idea is that if, as an earthly father, if my sons were to come to me and say, Dad, I'm hungry. Please give me some bread. And I say, why don't you go out in the yard and pick up a few rocks and chew on those? Well, that would just be a ridiculous thing for any father to do, to give his son a stone instead of some bread. Now, if you're a really messed up dad, maybe you do that. Uh, but most of us, as sinful men, in our nature being sinful, still understand what it means to provide for our own children out of a loving heart, trying to provide for them and feed them what they need in life. And so the illustration that's given here is that we are to uh, the Heavenly Father who is perfect, who is righteous, who is good. When you ask Him things and He knows your needs, how much more likely is it for Him to give you those answers to your prayers. So there's several questions here that have an understood answer. First of all, what man or, or father uh, would give his kid a stone instead of a, a bread or a snake instead of a fish if he were hungry? None. There would be no father that would do that, honestly. Then, if you are a man by, uh, which is by nature evil or selfish, give food to your, to, to your children who ask. That's normal, we would do that. Even as corrupt man, we're gonna provide for the needs of our own. How much more will your Father in heaven, who is perfect, who is holy, who is righteous, give good gifts to those who ask? And so we look here at verse number uh, 11, and it says, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Again, this is going back up to, in relating to verse number one, ask and it shall be given, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. So it's the, the promises that God will answer the prayers of his righteous people, the prayers of people who are praying according to his will, and how much more would a good father, a godly father, the heavenly father, give to his children for his purposes, for his will and his work. Obviously, he wants to meet those requests. The whole purpose of us as believers staying on this earth is so that God's message will go forward, that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. And He will bless those who put His ministry first and seek to do His will. When you pray about God's work, you can bet God's getting involved with that. And He wants us to be clean vessels and holy vessels, but He wants you also to have the privilege of answering prayer. We go back up now to verse number 6. And uh, this was from our text last week, and I want you to notice what it says here, because this ties into this portion of Scripture. Verse number 6 says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. So, if we go back to last week's message about 
those who are judgmental. Of course we know that God is a God who does teach us to judge, but judge righteously, judge properly. In this verse number 6, he was saying you're going to have to use good judgment. When you preach the gospel, when you minister about my word, consider your audience. In other words, the dogs and the swine were considered dirty creatures back in the Bible times. The Jews looked at the dogs and they used that as a euphemism for the Gentiles. And uh, swine were the offscouring of the earth. And we see how swine uh, wallow around in filth and mire. And so the illustration is, don't uh, uh, you need to consider who your audience is and you have to then use discernment or judgment. So God was not saying don't judge at all. He was saying use good judgment in who you're preaching to, who you're teaching to, who you're giving your advice to. Have you ever tried to give good advice to somebody who just won't listen? Well, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching the disciples. As you follow me, you're going to have to make good decisions on who you witness to and who you preach to. Now, we preach the gospel to all creatures, but there's times when you deal with people, they just don't want to hear what you have to say. You know when to stop talking, know when to just let them have to go their way and make bad decisions. As a Christian over the years, I've dealt with many different people and watch sadly many people make bad decisions. You try to offer advice. Sometimes you deal with people who just don't want to hear it from you. Maybe it's just because of they have an angst against you or maybe uh, you're the uh, object of uh, their uh, affection, I guess we can say, even though they're not really crazy about you. And so you try to offer them good advice, but they're just not going to receive it from you. The idea is don't, don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't, don't try to, you know, talk to, you know, or preach the message to a dog who's not going to hear it. And that's not a, a mean-spirited thing. You're saying, know your audience. Be careful about uh, how you go about trying to teach people who are not going to listen. Sometimes we have to just move on. And that's a hard decision sometimes. But sometimes you have to move on. Maybe later on they'll be ready to hear. Maybe they won't. But your job is to be discerning, to be judge, judgmental in knowing your audience and trying to preach the truth and teach the truth to people. So with that being said, we go back to our text and uh, we'll uh, look at our last main point, a prescribed practice, verse number 12. Um, this verse has been called, called the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Many people have heard about the golden rule. Well, James chapter 2, verse number 8 states this, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Now think about that. James called it the royal law. The royal law is loving your neighbor as yourself. And James says, if you practice that, you do well. So again, we tie this back into verse number 12. And listen to what verse number 12 says. Therefore, so therefore, in conclusion of what we've just read. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. This is the law and the prophets. Interesting that several times in the scriptures we see that there is um, the statement, this is the law and the prophets, or against such there is no law. Uh, very interesting that, of course, the law was what uh, the Jews always went back to. And the law states this, the law states this, we're supposed to live by the law. The problem is with religious people, they may quote the law, they may know the law, but very few have a relationship with the God of that law. So they can quote the law, they can try to have religious observances, we have many Christians come to our church even, and they have all types of uh, this religious mindset. Well, as long as I go to church, as long as I read my Bible, as long as I pray, all those are good things. But if they're thinking that's what gets them to heaven, then they're sadly mistaken. What gets us to heaven is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. By trusting that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that Jesus Christ is the only one that could pay my sin debt. He was my substitute. And when he died on that cross, was buried, resurrected from the dead, he fulfilled what was necessary to pay for John's sin debt, to pay for the whole world's sin debt. And it wasn't until I understood that and I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be my God and my Savior. That is the day that I became a child of God. That is the day where I had my sin debt uh, totally forgiven. And now I can start growing and living for him the way that he wants me to. So as you look back to this idea of the golden rule, 
Well, of course everybody wants people to live by the golden rule. Well, if I'm nice to you, you'll be nice to me. But we do it in a selfish way. It, it, the idea that Jesus was expressing is, no, you treat people in a loving way. You're to love God first, but then you're to love your neighbor as yourself. Why would Jesus Christ be saying that? He was saying that because they were so used to the religious rulers being so selfish in how they live their lives and what they imposed on the people. He was saying, what's going to make you distinct from the religious rulers of the day and from the secular leaders of the day? Your love for others will teach such a lesson to these people. And they'll say, what is it about you? Why, when somebody criticizes you, you don't criticize them back? Why is it that when someone's mean to you, you're not mean back? Why is it when someone's trying to take advantage of you, you don't take advantage back? That doesn't mean be a doormat, but it does mean that when they see the love that you have for others, they'll say something's different about this person because in our flesh, oh man, you do me wrong, I want to do you wrong. You're going to take advantage of me, then I want to either avoid you or I want to take advantage of you. What Jesus is saying is, don't be like them. You be someone that exemplifies Christ-likeness. For anybody, anyone out there who thinks that being a Christian means that you're weak, try to put that into practice. When someone's mean to you, you be nice to them. When someone's you know, trying to harm you, you, you turn the other cheek. That takes more of a man than most of us could ever imagine to walk away from those things. So we need God in our life to help us with these things. But also, he says, remember what he's saying, we need to make good judgments, be discerning about our audience, know how to handle ourselves. You know, there's some battles that are just a waste of our time. Why should Christians be fighting silly, nonsensical battles? There's too many people that went to Christ that want to hear it. There are too many people out there that want to learn more about God's Word. Don't argue and fight with people over silly, nonsensical things. We understand that God wants us to be different than the world standard or the religious standard what they were observing. He wants us to be good testimonies of Him in a loving way we are to represent Jesus Christ. So what is the royal law as James states it? The royal law is love thy neighbor. Now we would say, who is our neighbor? Anybody. Anyone you come in contact to, the idea is that's our neighbor. In about AD 20, as they say, uh, there was a rabbi named Hillel uh, he was challenged by a Gentile to summarize the law. And you can imagine, if you know the law, is many, many books, there's so much detail in the law. So he was challenged by a Gentile to summarize the law for him. And uh, he, he said this, What is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. This is the whole law. All the rest is commentary. Go and learn it. That's a great statement. Think about it. What, what is hateful to you. Now, in a sense, that is a selfish way of looking at it. If I'm only going to do good to you so that you do good back to me, then that's selfish. That's like a husband and wife. The only reason I'm going to love my wife is because if I don't love her, I won't get anything in return. Well, that's not biblical love. Biblical love is loving someone without the expectation you're going to get anything back. That's how Jesus loved you. When he died on the cross, you weren't even born yet. And he loved you enough to die for you with the expectation that someday you'll hear the gospel message, receive Him. And then your life would now be a trophy for God. You'll start living a life that honors Him. And so we want to make sure that we're using the royal law properly. Loving others, whether they love us back or not, doesn't matter. You love them. You do what's right. Give them the gospel. Treat them with kindness. Treat them with respect. And uh, there's a lot more to work through with that, but that's a good understanding of what the royal law is. And so this prescribed practice Practice the royal law. Practice loving your neighbor as yourself. We take good care of ourselves. How much care should we take of those who have not heard the gospel? How much more care should we take of those who come to the church? You may say, well, I wouldn't be friends with this person. Okay, but you can still love them. You can still treat them with respect and kindness. You can still minister to them. And so that's what God is calling us to do. A fervent follower of Jesus is one who applies his teaching to his own life first. Don't miss this. This was the title of the message, a fervent follower. Last week, it was fault finders. This week, it's a fervent follower. A fervent follower of Jesus is one who applies his teachings, God's teachings, to his own life first. You want to do away with your harsh and rash judgmental personality? Start by applying his royal law. 
Love thy neighbor as thyself. A fervent follower of Jesus is one who prays with persistence. Why do I need to pray? Ask, seek, knock. Because I don't know who I'm ministering to. I don't know who out, who's out there that still needs to hear the gospel. And so I'm going to ask and seek and knock and ask God for wisdom on how to minister to other peoples. Could that be applied to other areas in life? Absolutely. It's a great prayer promise. Uh, keep asking, seeking, knocking for other things. Maybe it's understanding of your spiritual gift. Maybe it's understanding of God's Word. Maybe it's how to be a better husband, a better wife, a better child. Maybe it's some other thing uh, uh, for finances or a job. God will allow you to ask for, for anything, but you must be asking according to His will. And so, uh, a fervent follower of Jesus is one who prays with persistence. A fervent follower is one who patiently waits on the Father's provision. Has God answered your prayer yet? No, then maybe you need to keep praying with patience. Some of us are impatient people. We want it now. God, you know, I want you to answer this prayer, and God, I want you to answer it right now. And if He doesn't answer it right now, we're on trying to figure it out ourselves, and we never get any further, or we'll give up on it. Learn to be patient waiting on God. And lastly, a fervent follower of Jesus Christ is, is one who practices the royal law. The loyal law. What's that? Loving your neighbor as yourself. Why? Jesus knew that that would change the minds of, and the hearts of men. If they see us as Christians being gracious, being kind to one another, sadly too many of our churches, you know, we're not as friendly as we should be to other Christians. Uh, when somebody is hurting or when someone does something wrong, we're the first ones maybe to attack them. That would not be what we're supposed to do. Now there's time for confronting sin, absolutely. But, there's, but we're always supposed to do it with a loving heart and, and a doing it in a proper way. So Jesus knew that if his men went out and spread the gospel, but they did it with love in their heart, and they demonstrated the royal law, then they would be much more successful than the Pharisees who are condemning, who are harsh and rash in their judgments. And listen, I've met many Christians who have been that way, and that's sad. It really is sad to see Christians that don't understand their own Bible, but have a pharisaical view of other people. And people can accuse you of all kinds of things, that, you know, because maybe they met you on a bad day, or, or maybe you had a certain opinion that didn't agree with their opinion, but then they're going to use that as their reason for not coming back to church, or that as a reason for, uh, you know, walking away from, from the Lord. There's all kinds of reasons people do uh, what they do, but you just need to be consistent. Learn to love people for who they are, be willing to share them the truth of the Word of God, even if it may offend them. But say, look, we're no different than you. We're no better than you are. We love you. We we're, we're, ha have our own issues too, but here's what God's Word says. And if you're in that position of sharing that with people, ask God for wisdom first. He may tell you, no, not now. Don't talk to that person. Consider your audience. But one of the things we want to be is a fervent follower of Jesus Christ. Put these things into practice. Well, I hope, folks, that you enjoy this Sunday and uh, relax with your family. Probably some of you have already been out digging, shoveling out your driveways. And so again, we feel, kind of feel bad that we had to cancel services on our property, but we figure the, the timing of the storm and just how much time it would take us to get everything together, might as well people relax at home. The use of this technology is fantastic and uh, I, I so appreciate the fact that we have people that are willing to, to work this way, our technology team. Uh, but we want to make sure, too, that you're safe. We'd much rather have you here for another service than having people rush around and coming to church in a frantic. And so this will give you the opportunity to stay in your own home, uh, to hopefully enjoy the teaching of the Word of God and now make application of it. How does this message pertain to you? How can you put it into practice? Ask God for wisdom there. I guarantee you He'll give you that understanding and the, and the knowledge of how to apply it. Here are the announcements for some of the upcoming events. On Sunday, January 31st, we have our Chili Chill Out. And so this will be after the morning service. Uh, we're asking people to bring their best uh, chili recipes, have it cooked, bring it in crock pots. And then after the service, we'll have our uh, chili cook-off, our contest. So we'll have, uh, they'll be judged based on the different types of chilies and we'll give our award to the best um, cup of chili. But we want you to come and enjoy that fellowship. If you're not a chili, uh, eater, then bring something else that you can enjoy that day. Uh, also, on uh, February 3rd, our Bible Adventure Club begins. That's our Wednesday night kids program. 
Uh, and so every Wednesday night we have our Bible study and our prayer meeting, which I think is probably the most important meeting of the week is our prayer meeting. We get uh, people that turn in uh, our connection card for prayer requests on it. We're continuing to pray for people that have some really serious needs. We, we gather in groups after the message and we pray for the needs of our people. But we're also in a study right now on Wednesday nights, Effective Bible Study. And so we want you to think about coming out to that on Wednesday nights. It'll enhance your understanding of God's Word and how to study God's Word. And we're only in lesson number four coming up this week, so come on out. But February 3rd, we start our children's program again on Wednesday nights. And so uh, while you're in studying, praying with us, your children will be cared for uh, with that program. Then Men's Prayer Breakfast coming up Saturday, February 6th at 8.30 a.m. And uh, we'd love for you to come out for that as well and enjoy that time, men. Men and boys bring a, a dish to share, and we have a short devotion time. We go over the needs of the facility, upcoming events, and uh, we have a time of prayer together. So, love to see you at some of these things. If you have any questions, please go to our website, give the church a call. But uh, why don't we go ahead and conclude in a word of prayer and uh, look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. No service, Sunday P, uh, evening service as well. So, we'll see you on Wednesday. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for your love for us. May you help us to take to heart the message from your word today, that we would be fervent followers of Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.